I want to tell you something. This, uh, this summer, I had the chance to go on a sabbatical. I got a, a month where I got to do some restoring. And in uh, the process of that one week, we went over to Bend, and I got to go to a church that was multi-site like us. And I got to go to the video campus, which is the, the campus that's similar to what I lead. And I walked in, and I couldn't believe how many things were so similar to us. They did three songs in a greeting time, and then they did announcements, and then they did this, and they had the video sermon. They didn't even take an offering. They put it in a giving box in the back, and I thought, this is exactly like us. They had a nicer building than we did, but it was, it was exactly <laughs> like us. But what was funny is that when I walked in and I saw it all, and I watched it all happen, I looked at how many things were similar. And they had a lot of glitter, but they were missing all of the magic. Because when we walked in, no one talked to me. And when we sat down, nobody talked to me. And when we did greeting time, no one talked to us. And I was thinking about this. We are in the name Family Church. Whether or not that is true is not whether or not it's in our name, but it's how we treat each other. And here's what I want to know. When people come here, do they find the magic or do they just find glitter? Because glitter is just that nasty stuff that gets left on your living room floor. Magic changes lives. It's so important. Hey, we're starting a brand new sermon series. Pull out your uh, program. There's a couple things in there you're going to need. One of them, there is a connect card. looks like this. You can fill that out. We're going to collect that at the end of the service. If you are a millennial, we also have an app for you that you can fill it out on there. So you can go ahead and do that. Also inside there, there is a program. You can, um, not a program. Inside there, there is an outline that you can use to follow along. We're starting a brand new sermon series called Being. And we are looking at the first half of the book of Ephesians. We're super excited about how this is going to go, um, how we're going to share with you a different perspective on how to read the Bible. So as we get started, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. Let's get started. So uh, there were a pair of cousins that grew up loving each other and caring for each other. One's name was Nikki and the other one's name was Willie. And the two of them lived in different countries, but during the summers they would spend time together. And they grew up as close, almost like brothers, if you can imagine cousins being like brothers. But they spent a lot of time together and really enjoyed and cared for each other. But there was a problem. As they grew up, they, they each led an organization that became very powerful. And they ended up in conflict in opposing perspectives of the other one. Which meant Nikki and Willie, who loved each other, found themselves at the precipice of a problem. Because Nikki, his full name was Tsar Nicholas II, and he was the leader of Russia. And Willie was Kaiser Wilhelm II, the leader of Germany. Though each of them were cousins and friends, they found themselves in the middle of different alliances. Russia was allied to the British and the French and the Triple Entente. And the Germans were part of the Central Powers. And in, in July of 1914, the two of them were writing letters back and forth saying, you got to stop this. And they, the other one said, you have to stop it. I can't. You have to stop it. And back and forth, they attempted to stop World War I. But if you pass fourth grade history, you know that it didn't work. And 17 million people died. There was another letter written in 1939. It was from Mahatma Gandhi who was the leader of India, who helped throw off the British oppression there. He did it by means that were um, without violence, a non-violence revolution. And he wrote a letter to Adolf Hitler and said, the direction you're going is tragic. Avert, you are in trouble. Do not do it. This will be a problem. And as we know, it didn't work. And 73 million people died. With those two letters, what if they had worked? 90 million people would have survived beyond World War I that wouldn't have happened, and World War II that wouldn't have happened. And I stop and think to myself, what's the most important letter, the most effective letter ever written? And I can't decide between two because I think there are two of them that are most important in the history of the world. And they were written almost 2,000 years ago by some dude trapped in a prison. His name was Paul. He was an apostle of Jesus Christ. He actually ended up writing multiple letters. Thirteen of them we still have, but two of them stand out. One of them is a book written, to, it's actually it's a book, we call it a book now. It was a letter written to a church in Rome. It's called Romans. The second one was written to a church in a place called Ephesus, and we call it Ephesians. Those two, I would submit, in the course of history, are the most important letters ever written. And here's why. Because today we're about to study that same letter and we're going to look across at every campus. 
We're going to look at what is said in those texts that can transform my life today. I have a friend who's teaching from Ephesians starting today in Roseburg right now. I texted him last night and said, hey, I'm praying for you. I know what you're about to be teaching. We're doing it too. A letter 2,000 years old is about to change our hearts. That's a powerful letter. What Gandhi couldn't do and what Nikki and Willie couldn't do, lives and histories can change because of these letters. So we're going to pick this up right there at the beginning. We're going to look at Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And let me tell you, we're going to do today differently. Oftentimes we'll take one chapter and we will look at what God says in it and we will evaluate our lives against that and we will say what needs to change. Today we're going to back up to 10,000 feet and say what is the whole of the, the entire text? What does it say in the direction it's heading and how do we know how to draw from it? So I'd like to welcome you to Bible Study Methods. We're going to have class today. It's going to be a little bit different than a normal sermon. This is going to help prepare you with some skill sets that you may not have. For those of you in green who have taken our Bible study methods class, a lot of this will seem very familiar to you. So let's pick this up in Ephesians 1, verse 1. Listen to this. There's a key word. If you're the type that has a paperback version of the Bible and you have a pen, there is one word I want you to circle because it is the, the linchpin of what we're talking about today. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to, there it was, it's just two letters. Two, circle it, it's really important. To God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. That right there, we're going to center in on this very beginning word right here. Two, because here's a real clarity that you need to know. The book of Ephesians wasn't written to you, South Umqua. It wasn't written to you, Green. And I know for sure it was not written to you, Sutherland. Who does it say it's written to? It's written to the people of Ephesus. Ephesus. Exactly. Which means you need to understand this. This book wasn't written to you, but it was written for you. Okay? It was preserved for 2,000 years. But it was written to a group of people that lived in Turkey. Raise your hand if you've ever lived in Turkey. Ne Green, I see that hand. Very good. I can't really see it. How many of you have lived 2,000 years ago? Okay, there's a few of you here in Sutherland. I see that. <laughs> it wasn't written to us. We live in Douglas County and we see through a lens that is 2019. They never once had a problem with social media. And yet we've never had a problem with some of the religious issues they had. And you don't have to understand this. The reality they lived in is not the reality we live in. So what we're going to look for is a universal principle. To begin with, I'm going to look at some regional background that will help you. Now, you need to know this. Most of what I'm going to share with you is not in your Bible. You'll need a historical perspective outside of the Bible. And here's my little caution for that. It's really helpful to get some of that perspective. But when that becomes what you're about, and it's about information, you may miss out what's in the actual Bible that can transform you. Okay? So it's good stuff, but it's not the only stuff. So as we're looking at regional background, I want you to look at this pictorial representation of how we're going to study the Bible. I'm going to walk you through this. This comes from a book called Grasping God's Word. If you have time, you need this book. Write this down. Grasping God's Word. It is the college textbook that we use to um, understand how to read the Bible more clearly. And I'll walk you through this. Number one question is, what was the reality of the people living back then? Number one, what was it like in Ephesus 2,000 years ago? You need to get that context. Number two is, what's the difference between them and us? And that's called your river. Is their culture different than Douglas County? It is. They didn't even have blue tarps. <laughs> They have a different language. They have a different time, a different situation. It's very different. And what you have to judge here on number two is how wide is that gap? There are some things that are very similar. They were a church. They had trusted in Jesus. There's some real similarities. They had an awesome kids ministry. Can't prove that, but I believe it's true. <laughs> there are some similarities. How wide is this? Then number three, this is the part you're going to hear us focus a lot in for the next six weeks. What's the bridging uh, the principalizing bridge. What is it that links us together? What is true in the Bible that was true for someone that lives in Ephesus 2,000 years ago, lived in England 1,000 years ago, lives in Venezuela now, lives in Sutherland today, or Green, or Myrtle Creek, or Tri-City, you live in Roseburg, Hewcrest, 
every context, there are certain things that are exactly the same because we have a bridge between them. And then the, uh, the fourth one is what's true of us today. And then the fifth one, you see a five, it's how we live it out. Okay, it was just a funny little story here. We were teaching this class uh, last year, and we do this every January. We teach this class in green. And uh, Drew teaches the part on, on interpretation. And for whatever reason, I don't remember why, but my six-year-old was sitting next to me in the class. I think he had something like a, a problem with a cold or something. And he's sitting next to me. And while he's sitting next to me, Drew asked a question. He said, what's similar between Ephesus and us today? And my son raised his hand. I'm like, oh, this is going to be good. Okay, I'm not like, put that hand. I'm like, I want to see what he has to say. And Drew says, uh, Anderson, what do you think? And Anderson looked at the picture and said, well, they both have roofs on their houses. <laughs> We're actually looking for something a little more culturally relevant, but it is true. Ephesus had roofs on their houses. Okay. So we're looking for, the next part is this big difference. Um, how different are they? I want to show you what Ephesus, this is what from archaeological perspectives, we believe Ephesus looked like at the time. So um, here we have, this is the, the plain where Ephesus was actually located. This is on the west side of Turkey. And as you can see, all of a sudden, there is a small city rising up. This is a digital remastering of uh, the city itself. You see that shaded, uh, or that uh, walkway that's shaded? We're going to come back to that. That is how they would um, keep their roads cool. There at the bottom of the screen, you'll see there's a, a, a square going up right now. That's called the Agora. That was the main central area where people met. Then as you move along throughout the rest of the city, you have a number of sections there uh, where they had um, more of those streets. There's also a library. There were a number of different temples that ran across. Now remember that one um, road that I was showing you uh, right there at the beginning where it had a long stretch that was covered. This is it uh, in a closer up. So this would have all been shaded along the side, but it leads to one of their main focal points. There were two of them. One of them is this amphitheater. This amphitheater, um, holds 25,000 people and was one of the main central areas. In fact, this amphitheater comes up in Scripture. In Acts chapter 19, we have one of the great riots in the history of the world that happens right here because the Apostle Paul was creating a big problem for the people in Ephesus. So the problem was that when uh, he came in, he started living out the family church mission. People helping people Great job, Green. I could hear you all the way up here. That was great. People helping people find and follow Jesus. And as the church came in, they um, would lead people that didn't know Jesus to Christ. And here's where the problem comes in. When you lead people to Christ, it changes who they are. And if it changes who they are, it may change how they spend their money. And some people stand to lose. And if you ever want to start a riot, raise your hand if you've ever started a riot. I asked that question last night, and this guy pointed at his wife. <laughs> I was like, uh, we, had, we had an intervention. It all worked out fine. The way that you do it is you make sure that you, you, you affect someone's pocketbook. That's almost a surefire way to do it. And this is how it happened. And this is in Acts chapter 19 telling you where this happened in, in the book of Acts. It'll tell you what happened in Ephesus. There was a silversmith named Demetrius who made silver shrines of Artemis. Now, if you've never heard of Artemis, that's the central goddess of Ephesus. Now, if, if you live in Ephesus, you're all about Artemis until you fall in love with Jesus. Yeah, that's going to create a problem because you would go buy a little shrine and you'd put it in your home and you would do whatever worship they would do to Artemis. And then they stopped buying them. Who's going to be upset about that? Demetrius and any other silversmith and anyone else they could rally. And he rallies the troops. This is a town of about 250,000 people. This is a major metropolitan area. This is the fourth largest city in all of the Roman Empire. And you are going to go against their central form of religion, and that caused some problems. If you hurt their pocketbook, they will come after you, especially if you do it with their central culture. Now remember, we're looking at what's the culture of Ephesus, and that'll tell us a lot about how we read the book and what understanding, what was it like for the person it was written to. So this Artemis, let me give you a little background on her. Uh, she came to Ephesus by, via a meteor that landed in about 600 BC. And so they built this amazing temple. Now you look at this and you think, it's just a temple. Okay, that's nice. It's actually made completely of marble with no other resource used. It's all marble. And wait till you hear this. It's actually 425 feet long. 
it's bigger than a football field. You could put, you could, there are stadiums, college stadiums, that are about the same size. This thing was massive. It was one of the original seven wonders of the ancient world. They put it up on a hillside, and the city, this actually came in in 550 B.C., we're now in 60, 61, 80, 600 years where this religion had been the central part of it. You know what word they didn't know a lot about? Unlike us, now picture this, Douglas County, raise your, raise your hand if you've ever driven through a town in Oregon that didn't have a church at all. Anyone? No. Every town you've been to in Oregon has some sort of church. In Ephesus, the only thing they had was this. They had never heard of Jesus until they heard of Jesus. You follow what I'm saying here? Which means their culture and their perspective of God was at zero. It is not the same perspective that you have. Remember, not written for you. Or it wasn't written to you. It was written for you. It was written to people who worshiped here. That's very, very different. Now, another place that you'll need to, to realize, whenever you're looking at this perspective of the letter that's written, or when you're doing Bible study and you're looking at the culture that they had there, Every culture in the history of the world deals with some sort of political reality. And Ephesus had a political reality. It was part of the Roman Empire, and the Roman Emperor was Domitian. He came into power in about 50 AD, and he lived until about 96 AD, which is the main center time that we focus on the book of Ephesus, or the book of Ephesians and the, and the city of Ephesus. He's the main leader. An interesting way that he used to function as a leader. He wanted to control everything in the Roman Empire. And here's the best way to do that. You want really good soldiers so they can oppress all of the people. Well, if you want good soldiers, what you need to do is you need to pay them well so that they can persecute the people. So here's how you do it. You tax the people so that then you could pay the soldiers to persecute them, which meant you paid for your own persecution. Isn't that great? What a genius way to do it, right? Make them pay for the way that we beat them down. And here's what I want you to notice. As you read Ephesians, you will read chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. All, we're going to do all six chapters this week in our devotions. You know what you will not find in any of it? There's no attempt to alter the political reality. You realize Venezuela right now has a political reality. And Oregon has a political reality. And England in a thousand years ago had a political reality. Not one of Paul's letters actually addressed us on how to change the political reality. Because he always addressed, listen to this, the real issue. And changing this does not change what's really needed. Because here's what's really needed. The real issue from then and now is not politics, it's sin. You know what's true about Douglas County? I know, I've seen you all. You're sinners. Okay? You know what's, no, no, okay, everyone but this section. All right, I got you. Right. You know what else is true of Ephesus? It's full of sinners. Okay? Sin is the issue, and what you will find in chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 is an alteration in your perspective of who you are in Christ and how sin affects you and what needs to change in the process. So realize this. There, you're living a po political reality in 2019 that's different than the one you grew up in. And you will live in a different one in 20 years. Things will continue to move politically, but understand this. There will be some universal truths that will still be, still be there for you. Man is sinful, and man needs Jesus. And when you look at Ephesians, it will deal with the real issue, because the real issue is sin. Now, uh, as we're doing this, we're looking at all of, um, all of Ephesus. One of the things I want you to know is in the Bible, it actually is referred to throughout the Bible. In the New Testament, I should say. It's in Acts, where I already showed you. And then the book of Ephesians is written to it. A, a little known thing is that actually the books of First and Second Timothy, that's their pastor, so when Paul wrote a letter to, to, to Timothy, he wrote two of them. Those letters are actually written to, to Ephesus because it was their pastor. Imagine if Ed and Paul was getting a letter from the Apostle Paul. Would that affect how we see each other and how we relate? Yeah, it would, it would impact the way that Paul preaches. Would you agree? By the way, it would affect the way Pastor Paul preaches if he got a letter from the Apostle Paul. Okay, follow that. Timothy was probably preaching differently. The most famous, two of the most famous lines in there is, um, all scriptures God breathed. Don't forget the Bible, he tells the pastor. And number two, he says, I know you're young, but don't let them look down on you because you're young, but set an example. These two key things, how much impact came on that church because Timothy was getting a letter from Paul too. And then also Revelation, about 30 years later, 35 years later, there's a, a small part in there that deals with some problems that were happening in this church. 
So as we look at for the next six weeks, we've given you some background, some understanding that their world was not our world. And maybe through that lens, it'll help you say, well, what's in the text and what's the principle that we need to hear about? So here's where we're really going to focus. This principalizing bridge, this thing is universal, true for them, true for us, true for South Umqua, true for Green, and will be true a thousand years from now. That's what we're looking for. Okay, so this is like, how does it, the biblical layout of this text? Okay, the first thing that you're going to see is the first three chapters are very, very different than the second three chapters. The first three are all about doctrine. Doctrine is like the foundation of what you believe. Okay, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. I believe that he died, and three days later he rose from the dead. And I believe my faith in him is the only thing that saves me. That's doctrine. That's basic. That's the basic belief structure. When you get to 4, 5, and 6, this is what we're going to focus on next year. And next fall, we're going to focus on those next three chapters. How do I relate to my wife? How do I relate to my kids? How do I relate to my boss? It's the interpersonal relationships that are there. It's how you live out what you learned in 1 through 3. So this year, we're going to really focus on uh, this doctrine idea. And you'll notice that almost all of them are about who God is and who we are. It's the being aspect, not the doing aspect. The first thing that um, we're going to start asking of the text, this is that looking for the universal principle, the thing that doesn't change. You know what doesn't change? Who God is. Okay, so we asked a simple question. Who is God? About eight or nine years ago, I started mentoring a guy, and I didn't really have a good context or a good idea How was I going to meet with him and help him grow? And how could we open the Bible and make it where someone who didn't know anything about the Bible could draw from it? And so I had this great idea. We're going to ask two questions. First question is, who is God? Question two, what should we do? And we looked at Ephesians, and then he was drawing stuff out I hadn't seen. I was like, this is the greatest. I went home. You ever walk in the door and you don't walk in? Because you get, you just, your day was so good, you, you move. When I got home, I didn't walk in the door. It was either levitating or I was, I was moving. But I got in there. And I said, Crystal, sit down. You're going to want to hear about your husband today. <laughs> and I said, oh, it was the greatest. We opened Ephesians and I asked these two critical questions. Who is God and what should we do? And we looked at the text and he showed me stuff I'd never seen. And I thought, man, this is amazing. It's going to revolutionize the world. I can't wait for other people to see what I saw in the text today. And Crystal goes, I think you missed something. You're the, you, ever, you, know, you know what can drop you to a junior higher more than anything? It's when someone says, I think you missed something. And I was like, what? No, I didn't. And she said, yeah, I think you missed a secondary question. You see, Krista was going through friend to friend, and they had read uh, Victory Over the Darkness and the Bondage Breakers, which talks about your identity. Guess what book talks about who our identity in Christ comes from? Ephesians. And she said, yeah, who is God is great. In fact, this is cool about this. You can ask this question of all 66 books. But specific to Ephesians, the secondary question, she said, but who am I? Because when you become a follower of Jesus, it changes the way you see the world. Your lenses change. And I will say this. When you become a follower, your lenses change, but they begin to change. Because it will take the rest of your life for God to continually change your perspective of who you are. But if you've been a follower and you're allowing... If you're allowing yourself to be humble and hear him speak to you, you will see yourself differently through that lens. The mirror will look different over time because you will see what God has done in your life. um, There's a book that came out about 10 years ago that um, Crystal read, and there's a movie that came out um, that followed it. It was called uh, The Help. And it was set in the 1960s in the South. It was uh, during the... um, Uh, the transformation where there was a greater freedom for African Americans in the South, but it focused on the maids and their impact on children in the Deep South. And as we were watching it, we realized there's a mom, the white mom with the white child, who continued to just basically scoffed at the daughter, said she was stupid, was putting an identity on the daughter that was heartbreaking. And there in a, a special moment, the help was the one speaking a different identity into the kid's heart. And there, there's a little girl trying to, to potty train, and the help gets in front of her and says, you was smart, you was kind, and you was important. And my heart was wrecked. 
because I stopped to think about, look what where the mom was speaking to the identity of this kid. And then look what the maid was saying. What she's saying is not true. Here's what's true about you. You're smart, you are kind, and you are important. And I walked away and said, what is the identity I'm speaking into my kids? And from that moment on, my daughter was about two when we first came across this. We started speaking a different truth to our daughter and to our son. And so we say five truths every day. We used to do them at bedtime. Now we do them on the way to school. We say, Anderson, what's true of you? Let me tell you, sometimes these aspirational. It ain't real. So you're not there yet. And the beauty of it is the kids say their five truths, and then I say my five truths, and Anna, or Crystal says her five truths. We say them, and then Crystal so wisely said, now you grab that and you put it in your pocket, and don't you forget it. And then every time my kids get out of the car, I say, don't forget who you are. And Anderson will say, I am brave, I am strong, I am wise, I am a, I'm a follower of Jesus, I am a servant. But the beauty of it, too, is if you need to be more of something, you can actually change it each day. Because some days I need to say, because it's aspirational, I am forgiving. And I am caring because I don't feel. And I start moving in this direction because I look at what the Ephesians says, and it says your identity is different when you're a follower of Jesus. And I wonder, what would it be like if someone growing up hears what is the truth that Jesus says about them, not what the world says? So here's what I want you to see. As you're looking for what's true, Back then and true today, what's that universal principle? I want you to say, who does it say that we are as followers of Jesus? When you become a follower, because you will find out that you are sealed until the day of redemption. You will find out that you have been renamed and you will find out that you have been chosen and that you are loved and that in him you are holy and you are blameless. I don't feel holy and I don't feel blameless, but that's the truth that Ephesians speaks to us. So I want you to begin asking, who am I through this lens? What is it that God says? My friend, uh, Zach Newman, he's our group's director at, at all of our campuses. He just got back from India where he spent some time uh, preaching and impacting the lives of the church there. And one of the things that he said is when you are part of a Hindu culture that's an oppressive Hindu culture, it's very violent if you become a follower of Jesus. It's, it's a violent response that they have. And one of the things that they do, if you become a follower of Jesus and you get baptized, you know what they do? They rename you with a biblical name. Now, when you're in India and some guy's name's John, it's not because his mom and dad liked it. He's been renamed. He's marked himself as a Christian. And let me tell you, he and his wife and his kids will pay. They will pay. I'm not going to tell you the stories. We're going to let Zach come share with you at some point. But they will pay desperately because the identity that says, I'm a follower of Jesus, it costs you there. But they change the name to Nehemiah or Stephen or John or Peter. And when you do... You're in for it. But when you do, your identity is so different. So we're going to look for the next six weeks on who is God and who am I. And then next year, we're going to look at the rest of the book, chapters four through six, the doing part. And we're going to answer that other question out of that. What should I do? And I, I'm going to tell you something. One through three is the foundation to for four through six. When you read these, if you don't first see the identity of who you are through that lens, it will only last so long. And if you do not have the heart change and see who God is and let him paint a new picture for you, then it will be short-lived. I'd like to tell you something. I'd like to speak specifically uh, to some of you who have been around a long time. I don't mean in years. I just mean that you've read Ephesians a lot of times. And honestly, you know more than most of us. We are never done having our view of God and our view of ourselves reshaped. And there's something that if you don't bring with you, it'll hurt you in the process. It's a willingness to be humble and to be challenged. And that's one of the things I'd like to make here is I'd like to make a personal challenge. I'd like you to be willing to say, what needs to change in me? For some of you, you are new to this, and I am so excited for you. Because what's going to happen is you have a very narrow perspective of who God is. You're seeing through the lens of the life you grew up in, of the world that your parents laid out for you, the world of your, the school laid out for you. And over the next six weeks, you're going to find that challenged. You know, I noticed that sometimes it's easier when it comes from an outside perspective. Last week, we heard from a, a missionary from South Africa. And I found myself intently listening to what he said not just because I liked his accent, and though I was moved by his accent, I think that is wonderful. What he said began to shift my heart. I felt like this crack in an area of my heart that I had not thought of. And what I found interesting is if the same principle he had said 
Paul or Ed had said to me, I probably would have said, yeah, that's a good point. We should probably preach on that. These people need to hear it. And I wouldn't have taken it personally. But when I heard someone from the outside talk about it, and this is the simple thing that he said. In Africa, we struggle with the test of adversity. You here in America struggle with the test of prosperity. And it is not an easier test. And as my heart began to wrap around that, there was a humility that had to come in and say, how am I going to face the test of prosperity, the test of busyness, the test of wanting more and coveting more? How am I going to face that test? And I was interested as I thought about that if Ed had told me that, I would have just nodded. And if Paul had spoken that to me, I would have said, hmm, why is it that an outsider can speak what an insider can't? And here's what I think it is. There takes a deeper level of humility. And here's what I'd ask of all of us. Let Ephesians be an outside source for a second. Not something you've known and done and read. I have already know this. Let it shape your view of God and of yourself. I do have a couple challenges that I want to give on a specific level. First, I'm going to release to the Green Campus and to the South Umqua, Pastor Paul and Pastor Sky. I love you and your campuses, and I'll see you guys soon. So the first question I want you to do, or this is really a challenge, I want you to actually write a letter to yourself this week. What are the areas where you think God may be revealing to you that there's something in you that doesn't line up with him? There's something in the direction of your belief or the direction of your life that you say, I, that's probably not right. You know it would be a lot more fun? To write a letter to someone else in the church. You know what I see in you? Here's how you're messed up. <laughs> but I want to move towards humility. And sometimes the best move in humility is to say, what is it in me that needs to change? If you want to do some outside research, and this I don't say lightly, and I don't mean this as a joke, ask someone who's close to you. Ask your spouse, what is it that I don't see? If you want to really be humble, ask your kids, what is it that I don't see? What is it in the way that I treat you isn't right? Where do you see selfishness in me? Where do you see that my identity comes from something else? And if you allow for that to happen, be ready. Pray up on your way into that conversation. But if we are humble enough to hear there's something wrong, something that needs to change, it's amazing how transformation happens. One of our values here at Family Church, we have four values T-R-I-M, the first one, that T is transformation. There is no hope of it without a humble heart. In fact, one of the highest values that comes out of it that you'll see that echoes out of it is quite simply just humility. The willingness to say what's wrong in me, which leads me to the next one. Be open to change. Open to change. I'm going to pray for us. God, I just, God, I pray first for myself. I pray that you'd give me a humility. I don't want to be just someone who came and spoke about it. I want to live it. God, I pray that you would give me a willingness to say, I don't have to have it my way, but I live it your way. God, I pray that here at the end of 2019, as for the next six weeks as we open this so critical letter in the, in the history of time, I pray that it would not just be a critical letter from history, it would be a critical letter in my life. Lord, I pray for those of us who have read it many, many times. I pray that when I open it up and I see that I, and I'm sealed and that I'm adopted and I'm chosen, that it would mean something different and I would see myself different. And when it says that you're a father, I would see what it means to be a good, good father. That I would ha have a picture painted of you that I've never seen before, that the details would be so clear and so vibrant. God, I pray that you change the lens through which we see. And give us the humility, Lord. We love you, Jesus. And in your name we pray. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me or if you'd like to let us know. Um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can uh, give us some feedback, we'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks. <laughs>